person. Uh, yeah. Was after we really talked on Zoom. Yeah. But yeah, I happen to be in Texas, and, and so here we are. Yeah. So you went to a big surgeons meeting up in Cleveland, Ohio. Tell me a little bit about what you learned there. I did. It was the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Mm -hmm. So it's an international meeting. We have um, surgeons coming from all around the world, mm -hmm. and everyone convenes and we talk about issues and go through some research papers and mm -hmm. all those things. There's a lot of things presented, a lot of topics, and one of the topics was radiofrequency ablation for benign thyroid nodules and even small cancers. So, mm -hmm. um, and so that was a learning point for me. I actually figured out that we are, our practice is doing the, one of the most in the country now. Wow. And I didn't realize that until I was there and a lot yeah. of them talked with me about it and had questions for me. So mm -hmm. it was, um, it was definitely a wonderful learning experience and kind of gained knowledge about how to move forward for radiofrequency ablation, make the best opportunity for the patient to save the thyroid. Was the topic of RFA really well received by the surgeons that were in attendance? It is. Yes. I mean, I read was for sure. That everyone's interested in it. Good. And I feel it's um, it's just new. And right. so I think being something that's not as well, we don't have a ton of research on it. We don't have a lot of evidence-based medicine yet, but I think that will come mm -hmm. with time. So we just have to give it the time and take care of our patients and mm -hmm. um, keep following them and kind of show our results. And I think at that point, it will be more evidence-based mm -hmm. for patients to kind of um, be involved in research studies right. moving forward. So. Yeah, we, we've got American data coming in now. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, we've just been operating off of the overseas data. Right. And so it's really good that we have our own data here in the U.S. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. And I... Yeah, the more and more we do of these cases and the more patients we see and care for this way, I think it's it's going to be the um, the, tr the new trend, I believe, mm -hmm. in saving the thyroid and avoiding thyroid surgery when you can. Mm -hmm. um, and preserving thyroid function, I think, is more important than anything for a patient. Um, That's so yeah. important. And it's especially nice to hear that from a surgeon who mm -hmm. has probably removed, you probably removed several thyroids in your career. But yes. Several, so, probably several thousand, yeah. I would say, over several yeah. thousand. So, um, and there are times that obviously you just still do that, yeah. Jen, when a patient has an aggressive thyroid cancer exactly. or a nodule just, you know, causing problems with their breathing or right. their nerves already involved. Um, so there are times that we lean into surgery, but mm -hmm. as much as I can, I'd like to save the thyroid because we have had patients that we've cared for for years and even our cancer patients, it's mm -hmm. hard to have them um, adjust their medicines, mm -hmm. uh, you know, year after year and, and not feel well. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I've, I've seen that enough and dealt with those patients and how they're um, struggling sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that's the biggest benefit to patients is not have to be on hormone for life mm -hmm. or adjusting your hormones mm -hmm. for years. You know, yeah, it's definitely so. a continual thing. It's not a once and done type situation. Right. I met a thyroid cancer survivor who had her surgery, I want to say 15 or 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And she told, I did not know this, but she told me it's constant, right. you know, monitoring of mm -hmm. her hormone levels and that she frequently swings from hypo to hyper yeah. and that it's, it's just really difficult. So, and I know there are a lot of people out there who do fine on thyroid medicine, right. but it's kind of a, a dice roll right. who's exactly. going to be that patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when it is, it's a very difficult thing to see and yeah. have them you know, experience. I, it's hard for me just seeing it as a physician and caring for them. This, <clears throat> I feel like it is partly, you know, me taking out the thyroid. So if I operate on a patient and take out the cancer, and it's, I feel a little bit irresponsible mm -hmm. for helping them feel better and get them to a place that they're more stable. Mm -hmm. I will say it's not common that we have patients that are struggling with this, but the ones that do struggle, it does, That's right. you know, Pull my heartstrings, if yeah. you will, you know, because I want them to feel better and mm -hmm. not have to, you know, adjust it all the time and have these mood swings or weight swings or whatever it is, hair loss and things that, that can happen. Mm -hmm. We just want to make them more stable so they don't have Definitely. to, you know, think about this all the time. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's the benefit, the uh, most benefit for me with RFA is patients telling me one month, three months, six months later that they now don't notice the nodules anymore right. they don't they're not affected by them in the labs where we've gotten on patients we've now gotten to the point where i don't necessarily make the patient get a lab it's only if they feel like their their uh, hormone imbalance is, is not exactly right 
<clears throat> but if they feel well, we don't even get labs anymore because so many patients have been normal. Mm -hmm. And I had a patient just ask me yesterday, what are the chances I'm going to be in hormone after the procedure? And she has right. a big nodule. And I told her she'd be the first one. We've done over 60 cases, and we have not had one patient need That's thyroid hormones. Right. So wow. I think that is the biggest benefit for the patient. I, I was curious, because I think last time we talked, you were about to do your first thyroid cancer uh, case mm -hmm. with RFA. Mm -hmm. How did that go? It went well. It went well. Okay. She tolerated very well. Um, the patient was very motivated. Mm -hmm. um, I, of course, talked to her about all the risks, and the biggest risk would be recurrence or that we have to operate at some point. Mm -hmm. But she had a small tumor. We actually did genetic testing on her. Mm -hmm. She did not have any aggressive um, gene positivity come back. So Good. since they were all um, more indolent, the tumor, we told her that we felt like she was a safe candidate for RFA. Mm -hmm. So far, she's had one follow-up with me. The tumor's smaller. She feels great. So she's really happy she did it. And I did tell her if it ever comes to the point that she was asking if, if, what if I needed surgery at some point? And if she does, she can still have surgery. There's nothing to, you know, stopping us from going in and operating, you know. And that's our, our most aggressive treatment for thyroid cancer. But mm -hmm. if we can treat someone with this heat therapy and stop the growth of the tumor mm -hmm. and hopefully regress um, the tumor cells or prevent them from growing, then um, I think it's a benefit for the patient, you know, in mm -hmm. so many areas. Um, aspects. Yeah, and they're doing this in other parts of the world. They're just observing these tumors. Mm -hmm. So no surgery, no RFA, and they're just watching them. I think it's harder um, to convince a patient just to watch a cancer and not do anything. Definitely. Um, especially, I mean, I think I would have a hard time with that, you know. I think I would too. Yeah, because you just never know. You yeah. just never know. And um, there are good studies out of other countries that ha they can follow these tumors and not operate. We have a few older patients that I've been following with thyroid cancer, known thyroid cancer, but they're at risk for um, anesthesia mm -hmm. because of you know pulmonary problems or um, heart issues or stents or blood thinners that they're on. And they, it's very risky for them to have an anesthetic. Yeah. Those patients I have followed, but there's only two to three of those. They've all done fine. Um, but I actually was thinking that the next time they come in to talk to them about RFA because we've had a few patients, you know, older than 70 and they're having problems swallowing because of the large goiter and they love the RFA option. Mm -hmm. They really did. Um, no surgery, no anesthesia and they get to go home right away right after we're done. And so they've done really, really well. Some of our um, older patients, I felt like they've really been happy about that as an option for them mm -hmm. instead of a big surgery. And when you're going through... Um, that time in your life and your health is more fragile, it's always, in my opinion, best to keep interventions as minimally invasive as possible. Oh, for sure. I mean, if uh, I were thinking about yeah. my parents or grandparents undergoing a surgery versus an RFA, I would absolutely lean to a Right, right. <laughs> I mean, the recovery in itself yeah. is so easy for them. You know? But yes, and I, you know, what I found in the older patient population is that they're their nerves are a little more fragile. Yeah. Their tissue's a little more fragile, as, yeah. as expected. And so the healing process is harder for them. It is a bit more yeah. um, of a uphill battle for them. Yeah. So I think RFA is something that can be used um, in the future, hopefully, for any patient, young, older, really anyone that has mm -hmm. thyroid disease that we can monitor mm -hmm. and hopefully control the growth on. I think they're a great candidate for it. What do you think would be the better approach when it comes to thyroid cancer? Treating it early, before it has a chance to grow, or watching it and then later deciding to treat it? Or is that maybe a case-by-case -case type situation? Definitely case-by-case, case, but in general, I would lean to do something early. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that, I just had um, a woman that we operated on earlier this week, and she had a tumor diagnosed in November, mm -hmm. and she's a busy mother. And with the pandemic, I guess there was another surge, and so a lot of people got nervous again and didn't go back to the doctor. She was recommended for surgery in November by a different surgeon. Um, but she came to see us, and I um, saw her, her tumor had grown significantly from November. So at that point, I told her, since it had grown and she had some lymph nodes that looked positive, mm -hmm. we had to remove her whole thyroid and some lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. Could it have been avoided, potentially, yes. you know, in November, that maybe she would have been a candidate for just a hemi or a partial thyroidectomy? She did carry the genetic aggressive gene, so, mm -hmm. it, so it is definitely case by case. And I do base a lot of my recommendations based on genetics. 
Oh, um, definitely. Because it, we know about tumor biology. We know which patients are going to have a tumor that has a higher recurrence rate, potentially higher lymph node metastases rate. So when we know that, we treat them a little more aggressively, depending on the age and all those other factors. But definitely size of tumor matters, and I think the smaller, the better to treat it early. If we can get regression of the tumor less than a centimeter, I tell them it's it's just ideal. And when we're following them, I tell them these tumors will grow. If there's something suspicious, as you said, some of our patients are even pregnant when they're diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. And we will follow them through the pregnancy if it hasn't grown and there are no lymph nodes. And especially if the patient's in their second trimester, we'd like them to go, or starting the third, we just let them finish the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then we operate when they're out of postpartum period. And they've done, we've done really well with that. But to your point, when you said when to operate early or do or have intervention, we had the, probably the most aggressive thyroid, aggressive thyroid cancer I've seen in my practice during COVID because so many young women, it was mainly young women, but they didn't come to the doctor and they're taking care of their families and you know, all these things. And so kids are home from school. They're not as, and so it was a lot on, especially mothers when it was kind of starting to regress a little bit, these patients presented and they had to have more surgery than mm. what we typically see mm. because this, the cancer had spread. I think that's happening across all medical specialties. Oh. We're seeing more things because people let things go. What do you think about the guidelines for biopsies? We know about RFA and that early treatment might be more beneficial, mm -hmm. but our biopsy guidelines, typically we don't biopsy anything under a centimeter. So how do you think RFA is going to change that or will it change that in the future? You know, it's, I, I think the guidelines are really good mm -hmm. and they're really strong and they're there for a reason. So I've, and there were been so much research put into the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But when I see a patient that has a nodule that's less than a centimeter and it looks suspicious to me, mm -hmm. or they have a history of thyroid cancer in their family, some type of radiation. I have some patients that have gone through breast cancer um, mm -hmm. treatments and have radiation, whole breast radiation. Those patients, I lean them to biopsy, even if it's less than a centimeter. Mm -hmm. Because I do agree with you, now that we have RFA and we can treat potentially patients without surgery, mm -hmm. I think that, that the smaller the better because we can get control of that tumor, you know, right away. So it doesn't, you know, progress or grow. Yeah. So it might change that because we do have a treatment option for them um, that's available that we didn't have a few years ago. So it's, it's hard to know how that will evolve, but I think it could change what we're doing biopsy related. It also depends on when the nodule's small, it's sometimes hard to sample it. So I tell patients that's, sometimes I have patients that come in and say, well, can't we just get a biopsy of it? But if it's too small, I tell them it's not necessarily accurate, and I have to get yeah. a certain amount of tissue from it. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes that's a little more difficult, the smaller it is. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see how it evolves in the future. Uh -huh. um, what would you say was your biggest take home from the conference? The conference? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's so new that I had a lot of surgeons asking me how I do things mm -hmm. and what I would recommend and when it could, what would be an ideal patient um, and several of them, you know, kind of just asking me what my thoughts are, which I was surprised by. I, mean, I guess I thought there were more RFAs being done, mm -hmm. um, and and there are. It's growing, but I didn't realize myself and our practice were one of the busiest mm -hmm. doing the RFA procedure. So, um, so I didn't expect to be on the teaching end a little bit, <laughs> but it was nice. Yeah, it was nice. It was good, and we have. A few surgeons that have come to watch us here mm -hmm. in Austin and observe the RFA procedures. So that's been it's been nice. I really enjoy teaching other doctors and mm -hmm. helping patients however I can. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's a, that's a big thing is the learning curve, you know, for the S procedure and getting more and more doctors and surgeons doing it. We did our training in Brazil because of the pandemic they hadn't done it in almost three years, I guess. So now they're they're doing the first one in July. So I, I think it's coming that. up. That so, is so exciting. Yeah. Those Patients were great. They were so helpful and they volunteered their time, wanted anyone to care for them and how anyone that they can, someone can learn off of them. They were willing to do that. And I thought that was really, really great. Wonderful patients we saw in Brazil and mm -hmm. um, helped us learn how to do this procedure and bring it back to the United States. Well, thank you for, for oh, letting me come today. This has been really, really neat to I'm see. So glad I always enjoy person. meeting everybody in person. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So much better than over a screen.